Okay, welcome back once again, you CISSP wannabes. These are the IT Dojo CISSP questions of the day. I am Colin Weaver, who every single day gives you two questions to ponder and contemplate and think about. Let's go ahead and get right to it. First question today coming at you from the world of networking. Which of the following is true regarding an IP routing table? Um, that's a lot of words in those answer choices, and I want you to pick four of them. Click pause, read them up, click play, we'll talk it through. Okay, first item on the list says that an IP routing table max MAC addresses and IP addresses to remote destination networks. That could not be farther from the truth. That's not what routing tables do. Routing tables don't store MAC addresses in any way, shape, or form. Um, routing tables store destination networks, outgoing interfaces, and next top IP addresses uh, for getting to those. A little bit of other stuff. We'll pepper that in there as we talk this through. But uh, MAC addresses are never stored in an IP routing table. They're stored in an ARP cache and are certainly important in the forwarding of uh, frames on an Ethernet network, but, um, but not part of a routing table. Next item says that it stores a list of destination networks. Absolutely. That's sort of the, the central point of what IP routing tables are all about, is they store a list of networks that this router knows how to get to and what interface and next hop it's going to use in order to get to them or forward traffic toward them. Maybe a more appropriate way of saying that. All right, how about it contains a mapping of IP addresses in the TCP and UDP ports for particular services? No, there's nothing about TCP or UDP ports ever involved in a routing table. Uh, none of that junk is stored in there. Next guy on the list, it is created automatically via SNMP exchanges between neighboring routers. Also could not be farther from the truth. SNMP has nothing to do with the creation of routing table entries. We're going to either use directly connected networks, static routes, or routing protocols in order to build our routing table. SNMP is some other dude doing his own different thing. Nothing to do with your routing tables. Okay, next contender says that routes learned via OSPF and or EIGRP are more trusted than standard static routes. That is also not true. Static routes are normally trusted way more than OSPF or EIGRP learned routes. Um, and really in most circumstances, the only way that something is gonna be more trusted than a static route is if the router is directly connected to that network himself. So the router trusts himself above all else, which is in the form of a directly connected route. Then static routes, which you, the administrator type in, those are loved next in line. Okay, and then all the routing protocols come after that in terms of their relative trustworthiness. Um, but OSPF and EIGRP are nowhere near static routes as far as trust is concerned. Next guy on the list says that your router is going to have a separate routing table for both IP version 4 and IP version 6. This is true. Okay. Absolutely true. Two protocols, two separate routing tables. All right, next option says that routers can route packets that have encrypted payloads. As long as the router can see the IP header, What's in the payload doesn't matter. That's the part of the beauty of IP is packaging is everything. So we can put whatever we want into the payload of an IP packet and the router can route that junk, okay, which is glorious and beautiful and why the internet works. All right, next contender says that routers, when they're exchanging routing protocol updates, um, secure it by using TLS or transport layer security. Nope, definitely not true. They do not do that. Next contender says that routers map MAC addresses to IP addresses. No, that's what ARP does, the Address Resolution Protocol in IP version 4. Uh, we use a multicast ICMP packet in IP version 6 in order to accomplish that same end result. But uh, for right now, we'll just keep it IP version 4 style. And that, none of those have anything to do with, um, uh, with IP version 6 or IP version 4 routing tables. That stuff's all about you know, local ARP caching or the equivalent of it in IP version 6. Then your last choice is going to have to be the correct choice because we need a fourth. I said you need four, which is that routers operate at layer three or the network layer of the OSI model. And this is absolutely true because routers are all about IP and IP functions at this layer and routing takes place logically at this layer as well. All right, for question number two today, let's talk about a little bit of redundancy. My question to you is, is of this big giant list, which of them are characteristics of RAID 1 or RAID level 1? Go ahead, I want you to pick two, so go ahead and click on pause, find the two right answers, then click play, and we'll break it all down. 
All right, first choice on the list says that it's called striping. That's not true. That's a term that we usually reserve for RAID 0. Second question or second item on the list says that uh, the parity data is striped across the drives. Uh, that is also not true of RAID Level 1. Third option on the list says that this stuff only works on solid state drives. That could not be farther from the truth. That is absolutely not correct. Fourth option says that all parity data is stored on the same drive. No. Um, RAID 1 doesn't use parity, so it's not stored, doesn't store parity anywhere because there is no parity in RAID 1. Okay, how about disk level encryption being enabled by default? Uh, nope, not true. Nothing to do with RAID at all. It has a one-to-one -one hard drive ratio. That is absolutely true. So if you, if, if you were going to do RAID 1, you got one disk and then you need another disk to be its mirror okay, to go in and do that. All right, how about providing dynamic data deduplication? No, it does not do that. Nothing to do with it again. Uh, we also call it mirroring. That's absolutely true. RAID 1 is called mirroring. Uh, the other term that you'll hear for RAID 1 is duplexing, and it depends on whether or not the disks are on one controller or two controllers. Uh, the common terminology is that if you're on one controller, we call it uh, disk mirroring if the two disks are on one controller. And if two disks are on separate controllers on the motherboard, then we would call it disk duplexing. But uh, a mirror is a very frequently associated term with RAID level 1. All right, looking at the remaining choices, it has a 1 to X ratio, where X is the number of drives. So um, in terms of the amount of parity used, again, because RAID level 1 doesn't use parity, this cannot be the right answer. How about fast write and slow read? Uh, nope, those are not characteristics of RAID Level 1 either. Uh, in RAID Level 1, the system can survive a single drive failure. It cannot, however, survive multiple drive failures. You're going to need a much sexier solution in RAID Level 1 to survive two disks failing at the same time. And then the very last item on this very long list is it has a 1 to 2 drive ratio. We know that can't be true because we already said higher up that it has a 1 to 1 drive ratio. So. What are we looking for here? We call it mirroring, and it has a one-to-one -one disk ratio from that big giant list. Those are characteristics of RAID Level 1. So I hope you dug those questions, and they help you as you continue to do your studying. Make sure you love on that like button. I'll appreciate it. Please subscribe, because I do this every single day, and I'll be back tomorrow.